So I'm going to talk about ex technical experiment building, and I'm going to talk about this sort of um, what I think it is, which is constructing these interactive experiences, I would say, between and provoking some kind of unorthodox responses to see what insights might emerge. And I'm also going to be talking about the Creative Commons groups and the open source licensing sites. And I'm also dividing the talk into three parts. And the first part is really about ideology and empowerment. And the second part is about creative teamwork. And the third part is about ownership and functionality. And why look at it this way? Well, I think these comparisons might shed a little bit of light, actually, on the differences and similarities between these groups. And so I'll show nine examples, like three in each of these uh, three parts, that I think are interesting in relation to making comparisons and drawing similarities and differences. So this is the reason why I've constructed it this way. So just, I think, what kind of makers that I'm talking about in this talk, well, I'm really talking about the extent of the global makers groups. And here you see, in fact, um, how many, 58 countries, in fact, are now have obviously sort of started these maker groups. And they're all networked and they're all connected and there's lots of sort of make magazines and all kinds of DIY help lines and all sorts of different sorts of potentials to actually sort of draw across this international network. And I'm going to be a little bit critical about this network, but I'm also going to be sort of referring to it throughout my talk. Um, so first I'm going to talk about this concepts of ideology and empowerment and the differences between makers media artists and media activists. So I'm going to start with this ideology, really, that is a rhetoric that's mostly coming out of the makers of the USA. And I think it's like very, very important to sort of realize that there's so many maker groups in the USA that this ideology is a kind of interesting, because it's such a capitalist country, it's actually a kind of combination, really, of Marxism, hackerism, and, and Dadaism. And this sort of combination, I think, is really interesting to think about. Now, Marx once said, of course, to develop, you know, to allow, allow people to produce actually lets them develop themselves in production, transform themselves, develop new powers and ideas, new modes of discourse, new needs, and new languages. And, you know, hacker was originally a term come from the 50s from actually around Boston. And the idea of a hacker at that point was a sort of self-determined life with a sense of responsibility towards society. And a use of, you know, to, the idea of, of a hacker was a person who used the system, really, and adapted it to yourself. In other words, you sort of were aware of it enough to be able to manipulate it. And hackerism has become a kind of, uh, a techno-social sort of urbanism and utopianism. And this whole idea of everything is makeable everywhere and any time is actually sort of very much related to this whole sort of idea of the definition of hackerism. And then together with this Duchamp concept of no division between art and life, this twist between meaning and function is like a very, very interesting kind of concept too. So for me, I want to see what seems to be the maker ideology of these big maker groups all over and networked is this combination of Marxism, hackerism, and Dadaism. So here you have even a book, this book, The New Industrial Revolution, yeah, Makers. So you've got a rhetoric coming out within this kind of dialogue and discourse that's really about um, coming from these three sorts of uh, different but similar kind of uh, ideologies. So one of the people that I wanted to choose who I think does fit these three ideologies is this Mrs. Balzar's laboratory from Venice. It's a feminist group of makers. There's about, I think, six main artists involved and they collect other f makers around them. They're fighting inequality by being tech savvy. They're, uh, they're interested in uh, kind of quit being consumers and become makers. 
what they're interested in learning, they think it changes us. They're also making different software and uh, communities surrounding that software. They're much more interested in this engineering potentials that based on community rather than well, you know, engineering that just is really well made. It's more about the community making it. And here you have the, some of the projects they've made also in Taiwan. But here at the top you have this sort of data object that they made called Mossolator, which is a group of moss that can actually be touched. And this moss, of course, in fact, um, changes the sound. So, you know, you've got this sort of spongy live material that can actually manipulate um, soundtracks. So let's compare that now to some media art resources and ideologies. So some media artists, including I would say some of these fit myself, would be interested in sort of using technology that's different from the mainstream. They'd be interested in exploring that technology in a different way, interested in using technology as a, me as a medium in itself, uh, to see sort of technology as an extension of, of, of oneself, and to create, of course, immersive, performative interaction on linear platforms. So you see some of the influences starting, I really think, with McLuhan, Marshall McLuhan, and then moving, in fact, into these ideas of the cyber body with Haraway, and then these influences again later of Paul Dorish and these ideas of like interaction. So these are the sorts of influences. I don't think there's all of them here, but I really do think that these are the sorts of influences that I would say most media artists tend to attribute to their ideology or tend to actually refer to when they're referring to their ideology. So media artists who are sort of representative of that would be somebody like Iorino Talisi. He's a Mexican-Italian artist. He's working with groups in Tanzania, he's doing mobile phone apps for them so that they can all speak together to each other. They, they put and upload uh, the things online. He does a sort of taxonomy of their expressions. So he's working a lot with community groups so that they can be empowered to develop their own voice. So this is the kind of work that actually is going on in the media arts that fits, I think, some of these ideologies about working with communities and opening up community groups. And so this piece is in fact called um, Sauti Ya Wakulum, is actually a project that's ongoing. You can go online and really have a look at the way in which this community is using this platform on an ongoing basis. So let's look at the difference now in ideologies of tactical medias or media activists. So <laughs> this, word, this term, tactical media, really comes also from a theoristic, theoretical backgrounds. And here you have like um, Gerd Loving, who actually worked with this, or sort of came up with these terms with a number of other journalists who are really looking at this sort of unexpected alliances that happen out of people working with technology and the use of these media technologies to shock and often reveal an antithesis. So these people believe you don't use media, you are the media. You are media. So therefore, you actually come from that basis in your ideology. It's quite a different background. So their strategies are to being the media, address crisis, address social and political statements, and coming from this different perspective. So one of the people I think is really fits into this construction is um, Wodyszko. You know, he's actually a, a Polish artist. He's working a lot with teams of people to bring a voice and visibility to different groups. Here he works with women workers on this idea of uh, called the Tijuana projection, where in fact uh, the voice of 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 uh, women who work in these factories in Tijuana is actually heard in a public environment, in a public sphere, in a public space. So the artist starts to kind of operate in this activism as a kind of mediated sort of nomad that actually moves through different views and different environments and starts to think about ways in which to change the way media is used and give people a voice. So I think that's quite interesting. It's a very different 
the women become the media in this project. So that's one group of the differences in ideology. And I think there's a difference, a different differences in creative processes, which might be also interesting to have a look at. But first I have to drink some water. Um, I mean, most creative processes from hackers, makers, or well, certainly makers, media activists, and also um, media artists, I think are all begin with this concept of what if. You know, what would happen if is a standing quest, I think, for the beginning of most processes in all three areas. So in the makers group, you have this kind of a real sort of attitude in the process of being a kind of moral crusader, um, in one who kind of functions like a sociologist. You're actually trying to even create a rhetoric around that concept. And you're actually interested, or most of makers that I've met, are interested in digital fabrication as a sheer sort of act of making fun and experience. And they're also fascinated by groups, transdisciplinary members with different sort of skills, to bring those groups together so that they have a skills base to actually work from. And sharing those skills is a major of major importance. Now, Marilla and I, who's here, I think she's up there, we actually spent a day at the Maker Fair in New York, which was hosted by the um, uh, New York Hall of Science in Queens. And I mean, we went around talking to people, and I mean, they all had this sort of m repair manifestos kind of displayed in huge sort of uh, locations around them, which for them was like the manifesto of the maker community to actually follow. This was all sort of about, you know, repairing is a creative challenge, repair is to discover, repair things are unique, repairing about independence, you can repair anything, even a plastic bag. So this recycling kind of concept came right through again and again that we were talking to all these people in the Maker Fair. And it was interesting that, um, you know, they are actually fascinated with bringing different things together in order to actually make a, an antithesis also in a way. Um, here you have an example. This is Hacteria from Switzerland. And they're not really interested in do it yourself, they say, but do it together. So. This is a facilitation of a community platform, uh, sort of with an open DIT, I call, rather than DIY technology and biological maker groups. It's quite interesting, I think, in terms of like um, looking at um, the maker process, the process of making. And, you know, they, they adapt and recycle tools. You know, here's this uh, one that actually I found a number of places, not only Hacteria had made it, it's a webcam, turning a webcam into a microscope. Or this one, which actually, from a workshop that Mark Dusada from Hacteria organized in uh, Yogyakarta in Indonesia about actually turning coconuts into speakers. Uh, so you have this sort of very dadist sort of, you know, I think quite dadist approaches here um, to making anything is fun and to, you know, it's very sort of open and playful kind of attitude. Um, in media art teams, I mean, I would say that when I look at a maker space, I would say, and I look at my studio when I'm in the middle of making an artwork, I couldn't really tell the difference between it because I use, you know, work with about six or seven people. We all get in there. We actually have to make something together. We're all involved in uh, amazing kind of uh, inventions in order to actually sort of pull something together. Um, but I think we're interested as artists, particularly in media artists, much more in the process of combining cultural content with questions about subjectivity and objectivity and to try to actually sort of brainstorm towards an, a result. And I think that's a very big difference between our processes and maker processes. And this is my piece that actually was mentioned before. It's actually at the... Um, at the Anatomische Museum. And there's a concrete aim to these kind of projects in media arts, and 
For example, this one was to make a quasi-real model of behavior of hair cells in the inner ear, and, and with the culturally relevant sounds and metaphors of scale somehow, somehow embedded into the project. So the, the result is a sort of a large-scale instrument that is actually a resemblance of the behavior of the ear itself. So even within this project, the content means I have to kind of collaborate with Aboriginal storytellers from the radio station and sort of like work with them. And that's their stories, not my stories. So the part, you know, there's quite a lot of similarities in a way of shared creativity in media artists making work and makers making work. Media activists, I think, on the other hand, are probably less material in their structures and in their processes, but they're still engaged much more in this aim of uh, an economic and dominant political order and somehow trying to address that. Because they feel that they are the media, then there's a sort of very different critical edge to the approach and to the process. So for example, here you have Critical Art Ensemble. I mean, they know how to do uh, 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 biotechnology. So what they do is they use their technology to actually speak and raise awareness in the public realm. So you have a kind of uh, quest to transfer information and share it, but in a very different way than media artists or makers, which I think is worthwhile talking about. So. What I can say is, in fact, makers, media artists, and activists all share interest in this hands-on material kind of consciousness, but perhaps media activists are more interested in the immaterial potentials of the media. So in a way, they are, have this material consciousness. Yeah. So in material consciousness, there's actually, according to this famous book, that's been used by the makers called Richard, by Richard Senner called The Craftsman. There's these different divisions of what materiality is. There's metamorphosis, which is sort of like this creative changes in procedure and technology is a new material for experimentation. Then there's anthropomorphosis, which is actually putting human qualities into raw materials. And then there's this presence, which is like different ways of leaving our marks. So these are sort of, as you can see from my, what I'm tracing, there's a lot of similarities between these three groups and there's some differences. But where the differences come out much more, I think, is in this ownership and functionality. This is where I think, which is my next stage of my talk, this is where the differences, I think, are very, you know, are much more apparent. So when we look at this category of ownership and functionality, um, we actually are looking at maker groups specifically because they believe in manufacturing and tinkering because they believe it might undermine, in fact, monopoly and commercial monopoly. There's a sort of, I would say, fairly Marxist approach there in relation to sharing technologies. The other investments are like this. People can invest in things they may, may themselves change. In other words, they take control and therefore think people would should invest in this um, potential. So here you have a quote by Mark Dusseiler, if you don't build your lab, then you don't own your lab. So the ownership is also about con taking control of building the materials. And for still others in the maker fair, money is anything that's, that's put into a network computer and that, uh, uh, that hasn't been done before. So, you know, a chair that collapses, um, uh, even to the point where um, you, know, you have um, a, a vacuum cleaner that is a robot that cleans your floor. So all of these new developments in tinkering have produced, of course, the amazing amount of creative commons license works. So you have like this enormous growth. I mean, I got this out of the internet, but it's pretty revealing, I think, how many new Creative Commons licenses have been issued in, in the last, well, um, not even seven years, eight years. So you have like 882 million licenses out there that the maker groups are adding to daily. Uh, 
So it's quite interesting. I've never put one up there, so <laughs> for me it's interesting. But other people, of course, you too, have done so. So it's quite interesting, you know, to look at who's using this Creative Commons and how it's being used um, and for whom. So critics worry, of course, that the lack of rewards for content producers will sort of dissuade artists from publishing in these areas. And they also um, talk about, in these groups like the Internet of Things, about this kind of um, potentials for uh, things to jump out of the make affairs in, through the Creative Commons and then finally to a product. So you've got like an incredible amount of interest in the industry, in the Creative Commons groups. And the reason, of course, is because they're hoping that they can draw innovation, of course, out of those group, out of those Commons licenses. And <laughs> they're also um, talking about sort of ownership, of course, becomes a big issue again. So there's a whole trend, in fact, about not necessarily what you own, but what is the means of intellectual production, the so-called, what we call the attention economy, the economy that's based on who is producing what and not is what is being produced. This is a whole new area of economy that people are talking about at the moment, particularly and writing books about who are economists like Jeremy Rifkin, um, the age of excess. All these people are, are coming on the bandwagon now, writing about the future of this kind of economy that's not goods-based, that's based on knowledge. So it's quite interesting. So, of course, right at the heart of every maker group and even in the media artist group is the Arduino <laughs> card. And who owns this card? That's quite interesting. Who actually is profiting from the money of, some, of a card that most people are calling open source? Well, actually, who's profiting from it is five groups, one in Italy, one in Germany, one in uh, uh, UK, one in America, and they're fighting with each other. In fact, there's a huge dispute at the moment that's actually about um, whether, in fact, the Italians should give the license to the Arduino for the Americans. And so, so you're getting like a little bit marketing problems going on even in the open source field, which I think is a, a really interesting development. So then there's all this make zine com, the magazine that tells you how to make and work with Arduino. And, but one of the things that I think is really interesting is something that, um, that uh, Jeremy Rifkin says. He says, bring your DIY mindset to our technology, but update your credit card first. <laughs> and I think what's interesting about that is that if you have a look at this group of the world's most innovative companies in consumer electronics, this is the group that we have to contend with about um, uh, who owns what. Now you can be open source and you can say, okay, great, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to um, uh, network and finance my things through this construction. But what actually happens is the hackers won their fight against IBM years ago, but they actually have lost it to Google and this group. So these are the groups of industries that are in fact getting the funding for almost every piece of electronics that you're buying. So it's quite interesting that um, most of those are uh, uh, well known to us. And um, it's important that we are realizing these things and we are actually kind of a little bit concerned, I think, about the future of an economy that has a monopoly on something that we're very, very concerned about building and we're very free, we think it's very free and open. So. Some people who are really interested in talking about this personalization and profiling of goods are one of these groups is called the is Blast Theory. And they're actually very interesting because they've, they've got a track record, really, of um, creating technology and sophisticated experiences. But they're also running workshops on hackativism, the politics, the social consciousness behind it, who's owning what, why. And these are the sorts of media art groups that are actually starting to question, in fact, the whole 
commercial profiling of uh, electronic technology and uh, maker groups. So there's a permanent and alternative media outlets starting to come up which are interested in looking and uh, criticizing um, the way in which our economy and our technology is running along with it. So then there's groups like this who are media activists who are really concerned, yes men, they're called, they're really concerned with like um, trying to work with satire and fiction to outrageously comment on the, uh, on the business events, on the internet, on the television and in the streets. And they're actually also um, concerned about how, in fact, who's using whom in relation to technology and, and the economy and the user groups. They privilege temporary hit and run interventions in the media sphere. And I think it helps other activists in the media area to promote change, to actually work with these kinds of people. The Yes Lab, I think, is actually open to any media people working um, together, and they're very, very open to, to collaborating. So the conclusion I'm having here, in terms of looking at the economic and, economic and, and ownership side of it, is quite a different, or sort of cast quite a different scenario and shadow on the whole, on the whole, um, areas of media production. And I mean, I think it's very, very important that we actually do criticize and um, evaluate and deconstruct again and again the sorts of hierarchies and the different sorts of uh, groups that are actually emerging. And I think we should take a closer look, really, at the political and social structures in which these material technologies are embedded. So if I wanted to conclude, I would have to say, under this section of ideology and empowerment, my question would be, can makers respond more clearly to the post-industrialism and the neoliberal globalization ideology that we now face? And when I look at the creative teamwork aims, I ask, can makers who, give, who are interested in a shared experience, media artists who are interested in much more content-driven platforms for experience, and media activists who are interested in satirical and informatic media spaces. My question to all of those groups would be, should makers move, in fact, from the creation of a shared experience to encompass more content-driven processes for media artists and media activists? In other words, should they let themselves be influenced by other media activists and artists who are actually perhaps more politically and ethically astute. And then the next question I have about ownership and functionality is, <coughs> does what we consider as useful have to be defined by economic interests of others? What would be the potential if critical makers were much more interested in being critical thinkers? So this to me is, and I mean by critical thinkers, I mean entering a kind of space that's both analytical and deductive. In other words, thinking about a communication problems and thinking about the issues of the future and the kind of economy and the, the idea of progress that mostly a handful of 10 companies are actually promoting. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you.